Now that we've laid out the different doctrines and gone into a little bit of detail regarding the definitions, we're going to work through Brian's video, The Godhead Doctrine, which he posted on February 12th, 2022. We're going to walk through the video and stop at each of the main arguments that he makes and work through them so that we can dig down into this subject uh, because his video is rather succinct, clarifies the main points of their arguments and contentions and some of the main points against the Trinity. So we're going to just work through this as it's a good representation. Brian begins his video with an argument against the Trinity based on Biblicism. I would like to talk to you today about the Godhead Doctrine. Now we're going to start out this study by looking up every reference to uh, Trinity in the King James Bible. Okay, We're going to go over all the scriptures that talk about, that use the word Trinity. We'll say it that way. Okay, you ready? Okay, we're done. Um, next, we're going to go to all the references that talk about the three persons. God in three persons, in other words. Okay, Every reference in, in the King James Bible to three persons pertain, as it pertains to the Trinity. Okay, you ready? All right, we're done. Uh, next, we're going to go to God the Son. Every reference in the King James Bible to God the Son. These are very important terms that prove the Trinity. All right, So let's turn in our Bibles. Actually, it's not, because we're done. Um, how about God the Holy Spirit? Okay, um, we're done. And finally, my favorite Trinitarian term of them, of them all, uh, divine essence. Okay, so we're going to uh, look at every reference in our King James Bible to divine essence, because that's very important there to talk about the thing that kind of connects all the members of, all the three persons of the Trinity. So divine essence would surely be in there, so let's look it up. Okay, we're done. Uh, if you don't understand my sarcasm there, uh, those words don't appear in the King James Bible. Kind of odd because the most supposedly the most important doctrine of the Christian faith, the Trinity, if you're a Trinitarian, um, and the very key words of your system are not in the King James Bible. They had to be added to the King James Bible. Hmm. Now since Trinity, three persons, etc., are not in the King James Bible, the Trinity is false. Now, his tongue-in-cheek statement, these are very important terms that prove the Trinity, betrays his misunderstanding of our reasons for believing this doctrine. Perhaps someone on YouTube or in a church without much theological training is unaware, but yes, those words are not in the Bible. But the assumption that they're in there doesn't form the basis for belief in the Trinity. Thus, to say that the doctrine is false because the words themselves are not in the Scripture doesn't disprove anything at all. His statement that those were added to the King James Bible is likewise untrue. This is Biblicism, yet keep this in mind later when he instructs you to use common sense. If Brian did any historical theology, he would find that his argument from Biblicism has been used by heretics for centuries and has been properly answered and refuted for the same period of time. Next, we move on to the three occurrences of the word Godhead in the King James Bible. I'll only make some brief comments on each one, uh, but after we go through all three uses, we'll dig a little deeper into this issue. But now let's look up the actual biblical term of Godhead. Go first to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're going to be hitting a lot of scriptures today and going to be moving pretty quickly, so... If I get there and I start reading before you can get there, pause the video and catch up to me then. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Now, right here you have a title. All right, a lot of people will say Godhead could also be translated as divinity or Godhood. That wouldn't make sense in the context of Acts 17, 29. It's talking about the Godhead, right? the biblical name for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Father, and the Holy Ghost. That's the Godhead. It's one person, one being, right? which we'll be proving in this study. He states that Godhead here is a title and that divinity, or another rendering, wouldn't make sense in this context because the context is talking about the Godhead which is the biblical name for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Of course, the word Godhead is used, but what's the meaning of the word here? Since it says Godhead, the meaning of that word can't be other than the word itself. 
then he assumes his own meaning of the term, then says that it can't not mean that because it's talking about the Godhead with his own meaning imported. This is just faulty reasoning. Next, let's go to Romans chapter 1. We'll look at the next reference to the Godhead. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 23. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's where they'll come in and they'll say, well, it could be divinity or Godhood or whatever. But God has it in his perfect word, the King James Bible, as Godhead. And you say, well, I don't, I don't believe the King James Bible. I believe it's the Greek or the Hebrew. Okay, then use the Greek or the Hebrew, you stupid hypocrite, you. All right. If you're going to hold to using the King James Bible and calling this book God's Word, then it has to be perfect. Otherwise, your God can't write a perfect book. Think about that one. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When they knew God, a past tense event, they glorified Him not as God. Why was Jesus Christ executed on the cross? Why was he crucified on the cross? Because he, they considered him to be a man and he was making himself to be God. And they're saying this is blasphemy. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You see? Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Every Trinitarian fits that verse. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Jesus the Son over here, God the Father over here, and to birds, <laughs> how about that? And four-footed beasts and creeping things. Jesus the Son, like this, and they got God the Father over here. You know, he has his little ball or whatever he you know, likes to play with. And then you have the Holy Spirit, the dove, above them, floating there. And he's making his little divine essence, you know, spray out on them or whatever else. Tingle showers or something like that. I mean, if you've seen one of the videos I did about the uh, Mennonite tingle showers. I think it's on the secondary channel. Uh, no, that's a teaching that's far into Scripture. It's not two men and a bird. That's not the Godhead. That's a pagan trinity, a pagan deity. The question isn't whether Godhead is correct or not here, but what does the word mean? We'll cover the horrid exegesis later on, but I do agree that these Roman Catholic depictions are blasphemous, and represent a fundamental misunderstanding, at the very least, of the doctrine of the Trinity. To depict or even to conceive of God as God is in himself, as a man, is an idolatrous act. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, we'll look at the next one. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, and we'll see the final reference to the word Godhead. Um, well, you need to respect my beliefs because I'm a Trinitarian. Your beliefs are wrong. If you believe in the Trinity, your beliefs are wrong, and you need to submit to the Word of God, the King James Bible. Your word Trinity is not in here. Your word three persons, plural persons, is never in here. Never once is it a reference to God. I should say it that way. It's persons is in there, but it's never once a reference to God, the Godhead, ever. Okay? Uh, so your speech should line up with the Scriptures. There's no God the Son in here or God the Holy Spirit, that title. Again, we have Biblicism being used as an argument against the doctrine of the Trinity. And again, since we don't believe the doctrine because of the presence of those words, it isn't disproven by their absence. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity predates the King James Bible. Christians believed it well before the English language. So again, using a standard which didn't exist then to disprove something believed then is anachronistic and ultimately fails. Better would be, to interact with the actual arguments and doctrinal standards to disprove the doctrine, or at least try to disprove the doctrine. There's no divine essence. Your system is based on lies. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through Trinitarianism, I mean, excuse me, philosophy, Trinitarianism, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, Things that are added to the scriptures are traditions of men. Brian says that there is no divine essence and your system is based on lies. Now, he is merely saying that divine essence doesn't appear in the King James Bible as such. But the divine essence is what God is. It's the whatness of God. The essence of Paul, John, and Luke is humanity. The essence of God is deity.
Richard Mueller notes that God is the only necessary self-existent being. The essence of God, as distinguished from the divine attributes, can be described as independent or self-subsistent spirit. Now, Brian believes that God is something and that God exists. So he does believe in divine essence as much as he mocks the term. He says that the Trinitarian system is based on lies, but I wonder what sort of lies these are. It seems that the lie is that these words and phrases are found in Scripture. But who is arguing that they are? If all you interact with are YouTube comments and books, but ignore what the books are actually saying, you might think that's true. But the real lie is that Trinitarians believe the doctrine because they think those words are in Scripture. I know of no one who would say such a thing. It's the meaning of Scripture we are after, not the bare words and phrases. This is similar to receiving instructions on baking a cake, but the instructions never explicitly say the end result is a cake. Would anyone familiar with cakes have to say that they can't say what the instructions are guiding them to make simply because it doesn't say cake? Certainly not. He claims that Trinitarians add to Scripture, but it's not proven that words are added to the text of the Bible by Trinitarians. He's arguing that summarizing Scripture's teaching with non-scriptural words is adding to Scripture. If one truthfully summarizes what Scripture teaches, yet uses language different from Scripture, he has not committed an error. If it were an error, any time Denlinger attempts to explain what Scripture means or uses an analogy for the Godhead, he would be adding to Scripture. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Who is Christ? He is God. Jesus Christ is God. He's not a third person or another person or the second member of the Trinity. He's God. And if he's God, then he has to be tied to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. They're one being. They don't shape shift like the modalists teach. They're one being. And I will be proving that throughout this study. He says that Jesus is God, not a second person, etc. But a fundamental point of the doctrine of the Trinity is that Jesus is God. Vital to the difference in our understandings and doctrine is the meanings of words and phrases used. This is a case in point. We believe that Jesus is God. This is a deeper point we won't delve into at the moment. But Jesus is God and is one being with the Father and Spirit. But they're not merely tied together as though they were independent things or persons. The divine essence subsists as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and these three are the divine essence and interpenetrate, which is called empirichoresis. Now, as an aside, where does Scripture say they are one being? What language is this? Where is this statement found in the Bible? Not after Christ, verse 8, in the verse 9, for in him, in context it's Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Jesus Christ was walking around on the earth, he wasn't somehow the son and daddy's up in heaven someplace in their separate persons and whatever else. No, the father is in heaven as the soul, but he's also in Jesus Christ at the same time. We are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now if you're saved. So we have a connection to heaven as well, just like Jesus Christ did. Right? Now he's correct when he says that during Jesus' earthly ministry, he and the Father are not separate persons. His estimation that the Father is omnipresent is partially correct. John 3.13 says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Note that Jesus does not say, My soul which is in heaven, or my spirit, but even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, as Jesus himself is God, and God is omnipresent, Jesus is omnipresent. But in the Godhead there, Jesus Christ is the Godhead. He is God manifest in the flesh. And if you come out as a Trinitarian and say, no, that's not true. He's him and the Father. They're two separate persons. You're a blasphemer. You're a heretic. And a lot of people are confused on the Trinity issue. I will grant you that. Right? It's very confusing when you look at it and you say, wait, okay, there's three separate persons, but there's not three separate gods, but there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they're not the same, but so they're not separate gods, but they're all the same God, yet they're not the same person. 
what? It's confusion. God's not the author of confusion. People are confused about the Trinity. But that's why I'm doing this study. That's why I wrote my book right back here, The Godhead Doctrine. We'll be talking about that throughout this study. Brian says that there's confusion in Trinitarianism and on the part of many people that have a very basic understanding, misunderstanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. That's correct. But it seems the main confusion is in his understanding. I don't think that to understand the doctrine is to believe it. But I'm not sure if it is ignorance or belligerence which drives his inability to confront the actual doctrine. Even if those basic professors that you run across on YouTube are ignorant, you should still utilize a reputable source on the doctrine, and that never happens. In the next video, we'll delve into the meaning of Godhead in its three appearances in the King James Bible.